Good morning. <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. It is so good to be um, back with you. I appreciate Brett giving me the opportunity to uh, share God's word with you. And um, Rebecca and the worship team, thank you for leading us this morning. Uh, let's pray. Lord, we have come before you to worship, to wait before you, and to hear your voice. May you open our eyes and show us how great you are, how, how great is your love for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. As Kellen said this morning, I am going to walk us through a very familiar passage, a very familiar story, the story of God asking Abraham to sacrifice his son. It is a familiar story. It's taught from Sunday school all the way on up. It is a famous story. Judaism, Christianity, Islam, all lay claim to this story as a core narrative. It is also a story that we read with some fear. The story takes us down paths, raises questions that are disturbing, troubling, and dark about God, about His relationship with us. Sometime later, how much later? Later than what? Do we go back to chapter 21? Do we go all the way back to the beginning? The vagueness is deliberate. The author actually wants us to go all the way back to the beginning. And when we do that, we find out that 25 years have passed, at least 25 years. And those 25 years have been shaped by two things, God's commands to Abraham God's promises to Abraham. And as Abraham responds to God, his commands and his promises, Abraham's faith and his obedience are shaped. The promises had three elements, land, descendants, a nation, and blessing. The critical promise, though, was the promise of descendants. If you don't have descendants, you can't have a nation. No people, no nation. If you don't have people, you can't hold any land. And if you have no people, there's no one to receive the blessing, and more importantly, no one through whom that blessing could reach the rest of the nations. It all came down to descendants. But that's where the reality of Abraham's life and Sarah's life collides with God's promises. By the time they received the promises, they were both advanced in age. He was 75, she was 65. And then there's this short phrase at the end of chapter 11. Sarah was barren, she had no children. The repetition, she was barren, she had no children, emphasizes Sarah's barrenness in the most painful, fullest form. She had no living children. She had never given birth. She had never carried a child in pregnancy. She had never conceived. God's promises collide with the reality of their lives. And over the next 25 years, the next 10 chapters, God overcomes all the obstacles. And we're familiar with the story. It is not Lot adopting his nephew. It is not adopting his servant, Eliezer. It is not even Ishmael when they pursue surrogate motherhood. God gives Abraham and Sarah Isaac. Now, in the process, Abraham's faith is shaped. He learns that he can trust God to fulfill his word. He learns that if God makes a promise, God will provide. It is not his responsibility to make it all happen. His responsibility is to obey God. What was God up to? He was building, shaping, preparing, equipping Abraham for the next words that we read. God tested. The Hebrew word takes a form 
that communicates a severe, difficult test, a test that will push Abraham to the very extreme of his limits. That's the kind of test. When God tests in Scripture, generally he has two purposes. One, he wants to produce a quality, or he wants to prove the absence or presence of equality. And in Genesis 22, I would suggest that God is doing the latter. He is testing Abraham to prove the presence or absence of equality. He wants to demonstrate. He wants to draw out. He wants to bring to the surface, does Abraham have something that I have been building in him for 25 years? The third thing about the the word test, who knows it's a test? God, the narrator, the writer, and we, the reader. Abraham does not know it's a test. What that does is we get inside information that Abraham does not have and it changes how we read the story. It creates tension, it creates suspense, it draws us into the story because we want to scream out to him. It's a test. He's not going to make you do it, but we can't. But that is how the writer has created the story. He's drawn us in with that inside information, and what it does is it changes our questions. Our first set of questions might have been, how can God do this? Does he not understand what he is asking Abraham to do? Does he not understand how much Abraham loves his child? How can God demand the murder of a child? We have those questions. But because we also know it's a test, we have a whole other set of questions. Why is God testing? What if Abraham fails? And then the most troubling one, will God test me? He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replies. Here I am. Does God not know where Abraham is? Of course he does. What Abraham is communicating to God by saying, here I am, is at your service. What would you like me to do? He is telling God, I am attentive. I'm tuned into you. I'm available. I'm ready and I'm willing. It, make me, it made me wonder, am I tuned into God? Am I in tune with him? Am I listening to a voice, his voice? What other voices am I listening to? What noise is crowding out God's voice in my life? Am I available? I find myself asking, Peter, how tightly are you holding on to the things in your life? And that led me to ask another question. Peter, how tightly are the things in my life holding on to me? If God called, could I extricate myself from my commitments and answer the call? Am I ready? What kind of shape am I in? Personally, family-wise, spiritually? Can God even use me? Am I in shape? What would it take to get into shape, to get my life in order? And am I willing? Here I am, he replied. And then we head into verse 2. Then God said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Before we dive into the verse, I need us to realize that the English translation is a little different from the Hebrew text. I put on the slide what the English translation says. Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go. 
The Hebrew text is a little different. It says, take, please, your son, your only. God just uses the adjective, your only, whom you love, and he puts Isaac at the very end. What does this all mean? Let's look at the verbs first. Take, go, sacrifice. They're all commands. They're all imperatives. What God wanted him to do was horrible. I want you to take your son, kill him, burn him to ashes. God, how can you demand child sacrifice? How can you ask a father to kill his own child? Is this not completely contradictory to your character? If you're Abraham, you have a whole other set of questions. What about the promises? It took me 25 years to learn that all the promises would come through Isaac, not Lot, not Ishmael, through Isaac. He is the heir to all of your promises to me. And now you're telling me to kill him and to burn him to ashes. How can this be? You want me to do what? For Abraham, offering his son up as a sacrifice beyond the horror of murdering your own child, he would completely destroy his past. Those 25 years of walking before God, waiting on God, were wasted. At best, they were futile. At worst, it was a cruel joke played on him by God. I'm going to dangle the promise of a son, and I'm going to take him back from you. His present is destroyed because he has to murder his own child. And he has no future because there is no heir. The same God who gave him the promises is now giving him a command that if he obeys, will destroy those promises. Let's look at the nouns. Take your son, your only, whom you love, Isaac. Take your son. Well, God, I have two. Your only. Now, only can mean number, quantity. But only can also refer to quality. Take your unique, take your special, take your miracle son. It is the second meaning that God is using because Abraham has two sons. Take your special, take your only, take your miracle son, born to you in your old age, born to your wife who has never, ever conceived. The son that I promised you, the son that I gave you, the son that I named, that son. Now, God himself acknowledges how special Isaac is. After the word take is the word please in the Hebrew text. We don't have it in any of our English texts. The please, take, please, softens the tone of God's command. Basically, it is a clue from God, Abraham, I know what I am asking you to do. I know how hard it is. I know how horrible the command I'm placing before you. I understand. And then God says, I know how special this son is to you. He is your unique son. And then God says, whom you love. God is not just referring to the deep affection of a parent for a child. In this story, he is referring to the love of a parent for a particular child that is favored above all others. 
Take your son, your only, the one that is your favorite. It is the same love that we read, Jacob loved Rachel. Jacob loved Joseph. Isaac loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. It is the love of a parent for a favored child. The God who gives the command to sacrifice the son is the same God who says, please sacrifice your son. Sacrifice the son that I know is unique, the son of, of a miracle, and sacrifice a son that I know you favor above all others. The God who gives the command is also communicating, I know what I am asking you to do is horrible. There is this tension between God's command, God's promises, God's compassion and empathy, and the instructions that he gives Abraham. The last word, Isaac. God names him. And what God has done is he's created a bullseye. You have increasingly smaller circles of identification. Take your son. I have two. Take your unique son, your special son. Take the son that you love at the very heart of the bullseye. He names the son. There is no getting around it. What God does is he increases the specificity of the identification, but at the same time, his acknowledgement of how deeply Abraham loves the child. You have this tension in the story. Now, we're only at the first two verses, okay? Now, the story will move on, but you need to understand how the story is set up to appreciate how Abraham plays it out. Early the next morning, not just next morning, early the next morning, the emphasis is there to communicate Abraham's immediate obedience. There is no negotiations. There's no objections. There is no pushback. Early the next morning, he gets going. Now, the text could read, early the next morning, Abraham set out for the place God had told him. You can jump from the first line right to the last line of the verse and skip all the stuff in the middle about his preparations. Why does the writer give us all this detail about chopping wood and gathering servants and saddling a donkey? If you look and dig a little deeper, you realize those details give us an idea of Abraham's state of mind. On the outside, He's obeying God early the next morning. On the inside, he's a mess. He saddles the donkey first and then goes and chops the wood. That is the ancient Eastern equivalent of putting your kids in the car, in the driveway, in the sun, going back into the house, packing the cooler, and getting all your clothes together for the weekend. It's illogical, but it reflects He's distracted. He's not himself. He's not thinking clearly. God's command has completely rocked his world. Why does a man who's over 100 years old go and chop wood when he has a teenage son and tens of servants? Why is the old man chopping the wood himself? I think... He wants to do something physical, repetitive, to help him process what God just dropped on him. The chopping of the wood is helping him process, you want me to do what? He's got to chop a lot of wood. They're not just roasting marshmallows on the mountain. He's got to take a 120-pound teenager and reduce that teenager to ashes. That is a lot of wood. And he's chopping it. The other interesting thing about the details is he's living in the desert. 
Very few trees around. Most of the trees are scrub brushes. You can't burn a hot fire with scrub. And yet he is finding wood. Where is he going? He's going up into the hill country where there's lots of forest, lots of wood. Why is he taking wood from the desert up into the hills where there's lots of trees? It's an evidence of his determination to fulfill what God had asked him. He did not want to take any chances that when he got up there, he couldn't fulfill what God had asked him. He was going to bring everything that he needed, even the wood. So on the one hand, you see him determined to obey God. On the other hand, he is disturbed, he's distraught, he's got questions. Why? How? What do you want me to do? I love this part of the story because what I see is that God allows us to be in a mess. We can make the decision to obey God and at the same time wrestle with doubts, with reasons, with purpose. God, do you not understand? How can you do this to me? The questions and the obedience can coexist. We don't have to have it all perfectly processed in our relationship with God. He can handle messiness. The tension of faith and fear are coexisting in Abraham at the same time. On the third day, second part of the story I love, God gives Abraham time. He's testing him. He's given him 25 years to prepare him for the test. And now he gives him three days to work through his questions. And what we see when he speaks to the servant, servants is where he got to in his thinking. We will go, we will worship, we will return to you. The interesting thing is, Abraham uses a form of the future tense in Hebrew that communicates determination. Very simplistically speaking, the future tense in Hebrew can be a future simple action. I will go to the store. This is my plan for the future. I will go to the store. The future tense in Hebrew can also be a future of determination, certainty, resolve. I will go to the store. It is the second one that Abraham uses for all three phrases. We will go over there. We will worship. And the two of us will come back down off this mountain. How could he say that? Well, one possibility, he's lying. He's lying so the servants and Isaac don't freak out. The old man has lost it. We've got to stop him. Because if Isaac takes off, there is no way Abraham's going to catch him. Maybe Abraham is lying to God. He is not going to carry it out. He'll go up to the mountain, and then he's going to stop. Or maybe he's hoping that God will change his mind. We know it's a test. Abraham does not. Or maybe... He got to a point in his faith that he came up with something completely audacious and out of the box. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 and 19, give us the background to what Abraham came up with. The writer of Hebrews tells us, Abraham's solution to God giving the promises of Isaac and then also commanding him to sacrifice Isaac, his solution was, God's going to raise him from the dead. I will kill him, burn him to ashes, and the God who gave me the promises will raise him from the dead. Completely mind-blowing. Because if you lived in the days of Elijah and Elisha, no problem. 
Those guys had raised people from the dead. Jesus raised people from the dead. Peter and Paul did it. Abraham's day? Uh Uh-uh. Had not been done before. Completely mind-blowing faith. Second thing is, when Elijah, Elisha, Jesus, Peter, and Paul, they actually had a physical body to resurrect. There was a corpse. Abraham is going to leave God with ashes. And he is going to believe that God would not only bring someone back to life, he would actually have to reconstruct his son from the dirt, the ashes of the fire. That is unbelievable, extraordinary faith. But that's where Abraham got to. Now, how did he get there? I think in those three days, he said, well, in the 25 years, what I learned was if God promised me a son, it was God's responsibility to provide that son. My responsibility is to obey his commands. He understood the division of labor in his relationship with God. God promises, God provides. God commands, I obey. I am not responsible for figuring out the provision. He took that lesson and applied it to Genesis 22. I will sacrifice that son. God, you're going to have to deal with the Isaac part. And the only solution he had was he's going to raise him from the dead. The story moves on. Isaac's no dummy. He's done this before. Dad, I see the knife, I see the wood, I know we're going to build the altar. Where's the lamb? It's the only dialogue between the two of them. Now, Abraham's answer is very strange. The Hebrew that he says to his son is very vague and can be interpreted in several ways. There are two things in his answer that are vague. The first is, the place of the word himself can be moved around in Abraham's answer. And by that, I mean, if you look on the slide, you can put the himself right in the middle. God will provide for himself the lamb. It is God who demands the lamb. It is God who will be satisfied by the lamb. And some of our English translations take it that way. The NIV takes to himself and puts it at the beginning, right after God. God himself will provide the lamb. The emphasis now is on who does the providing. The first option, God will provide the lamb for himself. It is God who is demanding the lamb. God will be satisfied by the lamb. The second option stresses the certainty of God providing. It is God who will do the providing. But there's actually a third place you can put the himself. God will provide himself as the lamb. All three are grammatically possible. So if you're Isaac listening to the answer from your father, you go, huh? What did my dad mean? God will provide the lamb for himself. God himself will provide the lamb. God will provide the lamb as himself. The other part that's vague is where the my son drops. It can go at the end as a term of address to Isaac. God will provide the lamb, my son. It can also go right after the word lamb. God himself will provide the lamb, comma, my son, comma, for the burnt offering. In other words, my son, Isaac, you are the lamb. That is why they walk on together in silence. 
This is a test for Isaac as much as it is a test for Abraham. Isaac is the next generation. He needs to know, can I trust my father? And can I trust my father's God? They get to the top of the mountain. We run across a series of verbs, series of actions. Abraham built an altar, arranged the wood, bound his son, laid him on the altar, reached out his hand, took the knife to slay his son. When you have a series of verbs that you have to plow through, it slows you down. But it also increases the tension, the suspense. The verbs are set up so that they are in a progression. The last verb is the climactic verb. It is the reason for all the previous actions. He builds the altar, arranges the wood, binds his son, lays him on the altar, reaches out his knife, reaches out his hand, takes the knife for the purpose of slaying his son. It is all pointing to that last step. Isaac most likely climbed onto the altar himself. Usually, when you offered a sacrifice, you killed the animal beside the altar. You picked up the carcass and put it on the altar. It's unlikely that Abraham, at his age, could have lifted up the dead weight of his son and put him on the altar. Isaac had to climb onto the altar himself. Abraham binds his son, ties him up, even though Isaac has climbed onto the altar himself, because Abraham does not want to take any chances that Isaac will change his mind. He is fully determined to obey God. Now, slaying Isaac is not the Sunday school picture of Abraham's hand high up in the air and the knife plunging through Isaac's chest. He has his left forearm resting on Isaac's forehead, pinning him to the altar. His right hand will take the knife and slit Isaac's throat, and Isaac will bleed out. His blood will be all over Abraham's hands and all over his clothes. This is what God is asking him to do. And then he has to light him on fire. But, best word in the Bible. Turning point of the story, changing direction of the story, that word represents grace in the Bible. But the angel of the Lord called out from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Abraham gives the exact same response. Here I am. I am as attentive, available, ready, and willing to stop as to start an action, God. Do not lay a hand on the boy. Do not do anything to him. The repetition. Don't touch him. In fact, don't do anything. Just stay where you are. Tells Abraham, the test is over. Abraham has demonstrated to God, he has proved to God the quality that God was looking for. And that was obedience. Now I know you fear God. Did God not know? Was God ignorant? Was this new knowledge? No, of course not. The I know is the I know of approval, praise, acknowledgement. It's the I know of I knew you could do it. I knew you had it in you. It is the praise that you give your children when they do well on a test or they do well in an athletic competition or in music or in whatever their hobbies are. I knew you could do it. I knew you had it in you. That is what God is saying to Abraham. What did he have? He feared God. And God describes what fear of God means. It's obedience. You have not withheld 
your son, your only son. And that's repeated in verse 16, verse 18, because you have obeyed me. That was the quality God was looking for. We know God provides a ram, and Abraham fulfills God's command. He goes, he takes the ram, and he sacrifices it. The ram in the place of his son. The idea of substitute. And then Abraham fulfills his words to the servants. At the very end of the story, he comes down off the mountain, and he returns to them, just like he said. We will go, we will worship, we will return. What do we learn from the story? Here I am. Am I attentive, available, ready, willing, like Abraham? God will test us, no doubt about that. But he will prepare us for that test. He will give us time to work through the test. And also, he tests us because he loves us. If he didn't love us, he would just ignore us. But because he wants us to be more and more like Christ, he tests us, producing qualities, proving the presence and absence of qualities. Obedience is absolutely a lesson in the story. It dominates the story. Obedience. But extraordinary obedience, regular obedience, it rests on something. It rests on trust. I will obey God's command because I will trust him for his provision. His responsibility is to provide. My responsibility is to obey. But the trust has to be anchored in something. And that fourth lesson, I think, is what God wanted to teach Abraham. The lesson being, he had waited all those years for his son. It had been hammered home. Everything's going to come through Isaac. It would be so easy for Abraham to put all of his trust and hopes on Isaac. If Isaac has a cold, do the promises tremble and quake? Isaac falls off his camel. Isaac gets malaria. Isaac is so fragile. And what God is reminding Abraham at the very end of his life, the promises do not depend on Isaac. They will come through Isaac, but they do not depend on him. The fulfillment of my promises of land, nation, and blessing, they depend on me. In fact, Abraham, you can kill your son, slit his throat, have his blood pour all over you and onto the ground. You can burn him to ashes, and guess what? I will reconstruct him from the ashes, raise him from the dead, and fulfill my promises through him. That is what God was telling Abraham. It does not depend on Isaac. In fact, you can kill him. He's a non-issue in my relationship with you. It is God that will fulfill his promises, not Isaac. All of us have Isaacs in our lives. Now, Isaacs are good things. They've been given to us by God. We need to put them in their place, though. They are the means through which God accomplishes but it is God who does the accomplishing. This story is not a story of repossession. God does not take Isaac back because that is the fear that we have when we read the story. What is God going to take from me? This powerful, sovereign God that I cannot do anything about is going to take from me the very thing that is more precious to me. The story is not about that. The story is about reorientation. It is not about repossession. God is saying, what I have given you, I have given you, and they are all good things. 
Just put them in their place. Keep things in perspective. What about the elephant in the room question? How can God do this to him? Does God not understand how much Abraham loves Isaac? God, do you not understand how much this means to me? God, do you not understand how long I have waited for this? What God is telling us and Abraham is, I understand more than you could ever imagine. God tells Abraham, I want you to sacrifice your son. But he let Abraham walk off the mountain with that son. 2,000 years later, God is going to take his son, his only unique, special son, whom he loved, Jesus. He's going to take him up that mountain, and he's going to leave him on Calvary. to redeem all of humanity. God asked Abraham to do what he himself was planning to do with his own son. Except for God, it was not a test. He was really going to do it. The answer to Isaac's question, where is the lamb? We get the answer in John chapter 1. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. God's last lesson to Abraham. Do I understand? Yes. Am I good? Can you trust my intentions? Yes. Do I love you? Does my love endure forever? Yes. Abraham can you trust me? Yes. Will you obey me? That is what God left for Abraham as the last lesson in his life. And through Abraham's life, that lesson is passed on to us. Can we say, here I am. I'm attentive. I'm available. I'm ready. I'm willing to trust you, God. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are great, you are good, and you are ever gracious towards us. We pray that this story of Abraham and what you showed him and have him walk through would play out in our lives, that your spirit would work this chapter and passage in us and in our church in the coming days, weeks, and months, and move us to where you want us to be. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our services are recorded at the People's Church in Toronto, Canada. If you live in the GTA or plan on visiting, please join us. We'd love to meet you.